Hello and welcome to Pots and Trials on Christmas Eve, which is brought to you with the support of Cobra Garden and Dalak. I've just been in the veg plot and got the veg ready for Christmas lunch tomorrow. I've popped into the potting shed because I'm going to answer some of your gardening questions. Well, happy Christmas Eve to everybody. Now, before I go into the kitchen with the veg that I've got out the garden and help Jill to start preparing it for Christmas lunch and Boxing Day, I thought I would sneak into the potting shed and answer some of your questions which you've sent in on Facebook. So we'll crack on because I know you've all got lots of things you want to be doing this evening. The first one comes from Carol Wall and it's about her lemon tree. Six feet tall, lovely plant by the sound of it. She has spent quite a bit of time wiping all the leaves to get rid of scale insect on there. And she wants to know if there's anything she can do in the future to get rid of them if they come back well I think you've done exactly the right thing I do the same with my citrus this is not a lemon this is a lime um, that I bought in from the greenhouse in fact one of the fruits fell off when I was carrying it in from the greenhouse that we'll enjoy with a gin and tonic maybe later on but scale insect is a sap sucking insect it attaches to the underside of the leaf and on the stalk you get them on all sorts of plants and they suck the sap out they give off a sticky honeydew and then you very often get a black sooty mold on there so it really spoils the appearance and weakens the plant wiping them off with a cloth just literally wiping the leaves on the top side and the underside or scraping any scales off that when you see them they look like little brown limpets is a, a really good way to physically remove them from the plant um, and you also find that it gets rid of any black sooty mold like just here there's a little bit on here from where we've had them in the past you can see that that's quite a, a dirty leaf if I just rub it with my finger you can see it is dirty so it just gets rid of the sooty mold it makes the plant look better allows the light to the leaf so it can photosynthesize but it also means you're inspecting it for looking for any pests but you could use one of the organic insecticides in the future if you wanted to these are usually plant-based or fatty acids soft soaps that type of thing and basically if you see the scale insects in the spring and they've got little bits of sort of almost like white cotton woolly fluff around the clusters of scale insect then give them a squirt with the organic insecticide and that that's very effective at that stage but otherwise just hang on to a cloth and just wipe them over now and again it's very therapeutic and the reward is of course a gin and tonic right rachel friend has been in touch and um, she wants to move a cooking apple that's too close to the pond well you can do that anytime now rachel we're in the dormant season and uh, this is not an old tree from what you've said in your in your message so dig it up with a good root ball and replant it and you've also asked what's the best compost to mix in with the clay soil well if you've made homemade compost uh, from garden waste that's ideal or if you can get some well rotted manure you can buy soil conditioners from garden centers and very often local authorities sell compost that's made from recycled garden waste so any of those and I would just mix that in with the soil plant the apple and then put a mulch of it around it and that will really help to improve the quality of the soil now we've had a question from Tim Bean. He says, is there anything you could advise a novice gardener like me to be doing during the winter months? Um, I've got a lawn area, some bedding and lots of pots. Well, certainly what I would say, Tim, is keep well off the lawn at this time of the year. It's gonna be really, really soggy and you're gonna do lots of damage if you trample over the lawn. So leave the lawn well alone. If you've got any bedding in pots at the moment, winter bedding, you might have some primulas or violas still in flower, um, then just check them over. If they've got any yellow leaves, you can take them off, any dead foliage, uh, any flowers, as soon as they fade, pick them over. And if they're in pots, and you said you've got lots of plants in pots, it's a good idea just to raise pots slightly above the ground so that water can drain through. So you can buy a little pot feet or just put some pebbles underneath them just to prevent the roots from getting waterlogged over winter. It's also a good time to plan ahead uh, for next year. Now, I, I don't know what your garden's like, but I do happen to know on good authority that you do enjoy the odd drink or two. So it's nice to have somewhere where you can sit out in the garden. It might be a coffee, it might be a glass of wine in an evening or a beer. So just plan the garden a bit and think where's the sun, where's a nice area to sit. You might want to put a gravel area down in the spring or a few paving slabs. And then also have a look you know, through gardening books or online of plants that you could put around there to make a nice, closed cozy little place to sit so lots of planning that you can do at this time of the year Rebecca Foster 
she sent a message saying her poinsettia always dies a couple of days after Boxing Day. And what can I do to ensure that it stays healthy into 2021? Well, this is a big problem, Becky, with poinsettias. They come from Mexico. They like warm uh, climate, warm temperatures. And very often they can get a bit of a shock when they're being moved from a garden center uh, or a florist home. They can get a bit of a chill in the car. So always try to keep it at a constant temperature if you can. When you get it home, it needs good light, um, not necessarily on a windowsill, that can be quite cool at night, but in, in good light from a natural source, and it needs to be kept fairly warm at all times. It doesn't want to be in a room that gets freezing cold at night or is too drafty. Uh, and if you can keep it warm and you can keep it in good light and keep the compost moist but not wet, then they'll usually be fine. If they're going to drop the leaves, they do it fairly quickly. If you get beyond Boxing Day, then fingers crossed, it's gonna be okay. And some people keep them from year to year. And I happen to know that in the village where you live, there is a lady called Glynis who's got one that's several years old, and it must be three feet tall and three feet across, and it is an absolute picture. If you sneak by and look in her living room window, you can see it, because it, it's there, fully in the room. So have a look at it. And now we've got a question from Mari Dupois. Now, I do apologize if I've pronounced that wrong. I'm not very good on pronunciation, but it's it's about a plant that you're growing called a, a Valtemia bracteata, which is a quite an unusual South African bulb. It produces lovely spikes of flowers, which look a little bit like a red hot poker, but in different colors, really unusual. And you're growing this in a pot in a cold greenhouse. You protect it over winter if it's really cold, but you do say that you live on the south coast of Ireland, so it's mild where you are anyway, but it's good to get it in the greenhouse to protect it from the wet winters. What the problem is, is your flower buds don't all open. Some of them seem to dry out before they open, where others on the plant are opening. Now that's usually some sort of a checking growth. So it may be that they are drying out too much at a critical point of growth. So although they'll stand being dry in their dormant period, once they start into growth, you do need to make sure that you water them. Grow them in a gritty compost so that they'll never get waterlogged. Any surplus water will drain away, uh, but make sure you water them. And it might be that they just need a little bit more feed just to help the flower buds form and develop properly. So um, seaweed fertilizer is ideal for that or one of the high potash feeds, the tomato feed is ideal. But I think with a little bit more water through the growing season and a bit of feed, hopefully all the flowers will open and they'll be perfectly okay on there. So good luck with that. And sorry for getting your name pronounced wrong. Um, we've had some Christmas greetings. Patricia Jones has said, Happy Christmas and thanks to all at Pots and Trials. So thank you, Patricia. And Sally Morgan also wishes us a happy Christmas. She's only just discovered Pots and Trials and she really enjoys the pint-sized advice. Now, I don't know whether that means because they're short, chunky videos or whether you're talking about me not being very tall, but I think I know what you mean. But thank you very much for watching and keep spreading the word. Right, Helen Hastings. Can't can't grow agapanthus. She's only getting leaves and no flowers, despite the fact that they are crowded in pots. Well, they do need to be fairly tightly together. Even if they're growing in the garden, they need to sort of establish and, and the roots need to knit together before they'll start to flower. So I suspect what it may be is that if they get too crowded in a pot, if they've been in the same pot for a number of years, then they get very, very congested and that can actually prevent them from flowering. So if that is the situation, and only you will know that, um, if you take it out and it's just one mass of root, then wait till about March time and divide it. Use a spade or an old carving knife to cut it into sort of a third and repot it in fresh compost. And that often just gives it that new lease and gets it growing again. The other thing is, if they're in a very cold area, although agapanthus are fairly tough, they will stand several degrees of frost outside, if they get frosted right at the top where the flower buds are, then it won't kill the foliage, that will grow the following year, but it just prevents them from flowering. So keep it somewhere sheltered. If you've got somewhere frost free, that is ideal. Or otherwise, if they're outside against a south facing wall, or maybe put some fleece over them if we've got really frosty weather. Uh, some people put a mulch of compost and then remove it uh, in the spring, a bit like a duvet on them. So have a go at that and see how you go. Um, Hilary Neary has got a houseplant question. She wants to know why she only has leaves on her amaryllis and no flowers. Well, 
I don't know how long you've had the bulbs. I mean, this is a, a lovely bulbous plant. It's again, another one from South Africa. We grow it very often through the winter. It's a lovely flowering plant in the house. If the bulbs are small when you buy them, Hilary, then they won't have developed a flower bud inside them. It's the same with any bulb, daffodils, tulips, small bulbs, don't always develop the flower. So what you may need to do is to grow it on for a season or two. So let it grow, let it produce the foliage um, and then keep it watered and fed right the way through the summer. And then when it dies down, hopefully the bulb will have increased in size and a flower bud will have developed for next year. Um, it can also sometimes be caused by overwatering in the early stages. Uh, they don't need too much water. Um, so see how you go with them and, and good luck. I hope they're better next year. Tracy Tinsley has got a problem with three nasty weeds in her garden, horsetail, cooch grass and petasites, which are all quite pernicious weeds. They're growing around the base of a tree, which is then covered with cobbles. And Tracy would like some ideas of how to tackle the weeds in the future. Well, these are problem weeds, especially um, the horsetail or mare's tail, the roots go down and down. Um, weed killers can be used on these and it won't affect the tree as long as you don't get it on the leaf of the tree. So there are weeds killers that you can use if you want to that will go down and kill the root but it's really difficult to kill horsetail you can use weed killers for years and years and they, they still come back so it will help to control them but it won't necessarily get rid of them all so what you could do if you wanted to and it involves a bit more work but I think it would pay off in the end through the winter anytime up until spring take the cobbles away um, and then clear off any of the dead plant debris there maybe fault the ground and get out any roots that you can to cultivate it and then lay one of the ground cover fabrics that you can buy a weed suppressant on the ground and these are really good they allow water and air down to the roots of the tree but they stop anything growing up and then you can cover your cobbles back over so it looks nice and decorative uh, and hopefully that will keep that area weed free Free forever the tree will grow fine and you won't have all those nasty weeds so give that a go we've got some more Christmas greetings now uh, from Mink Sumner Wilson uh, hello Mink hope you're keeping well I uh, haven't seen you for ages at the flower shows and also from Catherine Simmons um, they both send happy Christmas to us and we've been asked if we would give a special mention to one of our followers a lady called Annie Weisinger who lives near Salzburg in Austria so hello Annie and happy Christmas to you out there in Austria you've probably got snow where you are it's just wet and wet and horrible where we are in England uh, right, so we've got a question now coming towards the end. Valerie Mills, she wants to know if her James Grieve apple tree will recover from this. Well, as you can see from the photograph that should be on your screen now, it's not looking very good, is it, around the base of the trunk. Now, what this is, it is called apple canker. It's a fungal disease that affects lots of trees, including apples, and unfortunately, James Grieve is quite prone to it. Uh, the fungal spores get into a little wound. In this case, it's where the apple grafted quite close down uh, and then it just causes this decay now it can kill a tree because it can actually girdle the uh, the branch now if it's a top branch it's not a problem we can cut it back but this is the main trunk here so if it goes all the way around it basically cuts off the sap flow and the tree will die so what you need to do to try and rescue your tree is to get a sharp knife a garden knife or Stanley knife and pare away that black don't go all the way around the trunk just the bit we can see sort of in that cavity just cut it back so that you're getting back to nice green living tissue getting rid of all the dead on there and then get yourself one of the wound paints there are various types this one is called Mido which is like a thick paste uh, and this is uh, Arbrex which you can put on wounds as well it's got a little brush and you just dab it on so the idea is you're going to coat it with this sealant over it that will then prevent more fungal spores getting onto it and hopefully that will protect it. It will callus over, heal over naturally and grow away fine. The other thing also is make sure the drainage is good. It can be more of a problem if you've got heavy clay soil. So just fork the soil around it, maybe put a mulch in just to create better growing conditions for it. But fingers crossed it will be okay and it will grow out of it and be fine. Um, our final question is from Andrea Bradley. How does Mrs. Fish cook sprouts? Does she do it with a cross or without a cross on the bottom? So um, I've got the sprouts here. I've been and got them out of the garden. Maybe we should get Jill to come and answer this question uh, because although I'll be doing some of the preparation and eating, uh, Jill is uh, in charge of everything when we get to the kitchen. 
there you go so <laughs> do you make a cross in the bottom or not no but i remember when i was little i used to um help my mum get the veg ready for for christmas day and we always used to cut across in the bottom but i think it waterlogs them a little bit so i don't bother and i think the sprouts that we have are, are smaller and you i i don't bother with that no they're good aren't they mm. but you don't like sprouts much anyway do you like <laughs> no. at all. but um one of the recipes that i do which i'm going to be prepping tonight i cut my sprouts and then just slice them um and then i uh, cook a little bit of onion and a bit of butter a little bit of chicken stock in there just stir that through and then um heat the sprouts up when you're ready to cook it on the day and then pour in a bit of double cream a mm. little bit of nutmeg a few pine nuts sprinkled on the top as well so it's 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 lovely. very nice that and then we can have that warmed up on boxing day as well and somebody's got a birthday on Boxing Day. They have got a birthday. I think it's Andrew. I think it's your birthday on Boxing Day. So happy birthday, Andrew. And thank you for, for following us. But I'm ready for the veg in the veg You're ready for now. the veg. Right. OK. Yeah. So we've finished our Christmas Eve question time special. It's off to the kitchen with the veg. So we'd like to wish you a happy Christmas. Sean, unfortunately, can't be with us for obvious reasons. So we'd like to thank Sean for all the work he does back down in the edit suite and everything, keeping us on the straight now. Thank you to all of you for watching us and sharing all the videos is we really really do appreciate it so we'd like to wish you all a very very happy christmas and we'll be back on new year's eve when we're going to be sorting out tools and machinery getting everything ready for the new year and the new gardening season so we will see you then all the best and happy christmas happy christmas i'd rather have a mince pie than what you're eating oh i'm gonna have a raw brussel you can't beat a raw <laughs> brussel mm. oh delicious cheers <laughs> <laughs>